Well, I want to talk to you today. The title that I'm using is a title called Uphill Habits. And I want to talk to you specifically about some disciplines, some things that we each and all need to instill into our lives if we're going to be the version of ourselves that God has called us to be, if we're going to accomplish the things that God has called us to accomplish. Every single one of us, we're here on this planet for a specific reason. None of you are here by accident. None of you are here to just waste time. You're all here because there is a gift that God embedded inside of you. He wove it into the fabric of your being. And there are people that you are supposed to impact with your life. And if we're not careful, we can become people that instead of making it happen and going out there and doing what God has called us to do, we make excuses. Because stuff happens in life. Stuff happens. Snow happens. Things happen and people make excuses. This happens so they hit the snooze button. This happens so they give up. This happens so they quit their job. This happens so, and so all of these things that can happen to us in life, and, and if we're not careful, we can opt out of God's best unintentionally. This year, God has given me a specific uh, word and a theme for the year, Pastor Adam, and every single year, God gives me something. I specifically pray and ask the Father to show me the theme of the year for my life and specifically for our congregation, and I believe it, it's all interconnected. And the, the theme that God gave me this year was simply this, no excuses. No excuses. What he means by that is that he is aligning things specifically together so that we as his people can walk into opportunities that he has set for us in advance before the beginning of time. And this is the year that we're to stop making excuses and start moving forward into what he's called us to do. Amen? No excuses. No excuses. Uh, some of you may know I, I started a, a side business. I pastor a church and I have a side. God opened some crazy cool doors for me to begin to do consulting and coaching and training uh, in different companies like uh, Whole Foods and La Madeleine and, and a number of different uh, companies that, that you may or may not have heard of. And it's incredible what the word of God can do when you take it inside of a business and use the same word that you use on Sunday morning, but inside of a business. The word of God is unbelievably powerful. But what happened is my hobby um, used to be fitness, and then it became my new little business project, and so I gained like 25 pounds in the last two years, and, and you may think, oh, what? you just look, you look fine. It's smoke and mirrors, baby. It's smoke and mirrors. That's all I got to tell you, all right? It's, it's, you know, I'm sucking in this way and standing sideways and do pictures like, I'm just, <laughs> sorry. It's funny how girls do pictures. They have to stand a certain way to, I don't know what, I don't know what it does, but they all do it, right? And they turn and they put their shoulder back and I don't know, but I'm going to start standing like that just so I can hide stuff. Um, I'm not going to stand like that. I was just joking. All of you online, please don't screenshot that moment and then share that around. That was not good. That was not good. But, um, but for me, I know, and, and I hope you know that it doesn't matter how many great things you do, it doesn't matter how talented you are, it doesn't matter how much potential you have, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how, uh, how able you are, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter any of that kind of stuff. If your health does not stay up, you're going to die earlier. And it doesn't, none of those other things matter if you die sooner, right? I, I don't want to get to heaven and the Lord be like, uh, you knew that like heart things ran in your family, right? And you, you picked the fried chicken anyway. You didn't care. You, you, I mean, I, I had more for you to do, but now you're up here with me because you wouldn't put your fork down. And, and, and so, listen, I, we're going to stand before him. I don't want to stand before him and get a pretty good job, buddy. I want to get a well done, right? 
And so this is, and man, I got kids, and I want to feel good, and I want to, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I've hit, I'm, I'll be 45 this year, and I'm sneaking up there. I got one gray hair, Adam. I got one. Look at it. It's right there. It's right there. Right, that one right there. But my problem is not the color of my hair. My problem is keeping them up on my head. Uh, so I'm going to, dude, I'm going to kill a skunk and glue it up there if I have to. It's not going away. I promise. I promise. But the thing is this, is that if we, the habits that we have in our life either take us up or take us down. And there are different types of us, right? There, there are some people that are very, very, very disciplined and structured. And I, I, I have a lot of really, really good habits. But I also have some bad habits that in this year I'm submitting to the Lord. Because if, if we're really all honest... There are certain things that when we get stressed, when we feel pressure, when we get angry, when we get worn out, when we're exhausted, there are things, Alex, that we reach for instead of reaching for God. Some people get stressed and so they reach for a, a cigarette or for, a, for a, a beautiful glass with a tall stem. Some people get stressed, and, and so, they, so they, just, they just, I can't take any more of this, and they, they escape into Netflix for 72 episodes. Social media for hours. I, I mean, listen, anything that, we're, if anything that we're reaching for instead of reaching for God can become sin. Doesn't even need to be something that would fit into a classification of, right? I mean, the way I grew up in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's like, you know, you don't drink and you don't smoke and you don't chew and you don't, they would say, don't go out with girls that do. If you're, if you're looking at girls that would chew, I, I mean, that's, that's, that's Oklahoma. That's where I grew up. I grew up in a very spiritual and biblical um, atmosphere. I remember one of my buddies was from... Uh, Catoosa, uh, Oklahoma. All the towns in Oklahoma have Indian names because uh, it's the names of the people we stole the land from, I guess. I don't know. Um, but that's not really funny. Um, I'm sorry that I said that. Uh, but I guess that's kind of partially true. And so my friend Matt, we're going to his little uh, fish fry family reunion. And Matt starts talking about, and we're 16, he starts talking about all the pretty girls that are going to be there. And, and, and I'm, I'm not that smart, but I put two and two together. And I'm like, Matt, I thought you said we're going to one of your family reunions. He goes, yeah, but they're like second and third cousins. They don't count. That is a true story of an Oklahoman. That's why I got out of there as fast as I could. It's a lot like how it was in the Bible. We're going to read some stories about uh, people marrying sisters and cousins and stuff. Apparently it was okay back in the day. It's not okay now. It's not okay. <clears throat> a lot of things that you can pursue in life. We all have different pursuits. We all have things that we go after, right? We all have things that we want to attain and accomplish. And, and, and there are things that God wants you to pursue and wants you to attain and wants you to accomplish. But if we're not careful, we can put the cart before the horse. And good things that God intends for us to have and walk in and enjoy can eclipse him. And they could even become an idol in our life if we're not careful. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he's talking to them specifically about their priorities. He says this in verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Another passage says they will be added unto you as well. Jesus is literally giving the instructions on how to create the right type of priorities so that in doing so, 
we can still receive the things that we desire and need in our lives. It's not a bad thing for me as a father to want good things for my children. It's not a bad thing for me to want for them to be able to go to a great university and get a great degree. It's not a bad thing for me to want to be able to provide things for them so that they could have a leg up in life. I hope you want good things for your children. And how much more does your heavenly father want good things for you? Because he's better than you are as a parent. And he has access to everything. But he can't give us everything all at once. In the same way that we don't give our kids everything all at once. We have to let them grow up into it. My daughter turned 14. Uh, we acquired some land we're going to build. We've got 11 acres and we want to pick up another 40. And we've got some cows and, uh, and, and we're going to build a new house. And, and so I got a 14-year-old little girl that had a birthday this last week. And, and I went out and I jumped on Craigslist. I think you probably have that in Denver. And I found an old uh, 2004 F-150 pick em up truck, man. I mean, a beater. Just, a, I mean, just an old, tough Ford pickup truck. And I bought, because we need one for the farm anyway and doing some work. And, and my daughter's 14, and, and I, and I want to start teaching her how to drive because driving in Dallas is terrifying. If you've never done it, it's like Six Flags, but deadlier. And when you have a little girl who's timid, the last thing I want is for her to not be practiced. So I bought this old, I mean, it is an old truck, right? It, it's, it is, it's not, it, <laughs> when I told her how much it cost, she's like, uh, that's not very much. I'm like, exactly. I don't want you to damage something expensive. I'm going to teach her how to drive, but not in my car. No way. Not in my wife's car. Heck No. So, so she, I mean, she got this little pickup truck for her birthday, and, 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 and I took her on her first driving lesson, and, and my wife and I committed and formed this covenant with her as a 14-year-old that we're going to spend the next four years equipping you, preparing you to be the, this, this godly adult woman, and we're going to treat you as if you're an adult now. Come on, parents, parents love their kids so much that they want to invest in them and they want to baby step them in and grow them into where we can release them in the future. But we also have to be wise not to release them too soon. And God, how, how much more is God in a position? He has access to everything. There's nothing he lacks. But, but, the way we carry ourselves, the way we live our lives, before him determines what he can release into us. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. The sad reality is a lot of people and a lot of Christians believe in Jesus, love God, but get caught up pursuing their own kingdom and their own rightness. How many fights have I been in with my wife because I'm right? I'm, I'm talking about me. I know you would never. And when I mean fight, I mean passionate discussions. Because we never throw big objects. <laughs> Pastors are people too, right? We're all humans. And, and we have things that we have to work through and I hope you're okay with having pastors that are humans. That would be really awkward if they weren't. But, but we, we, we have this need to be right sometimes. How many, how many times have we been in arguments because we're right and we want someone else to know we're right and they don't see yet that we're right, so we persist in this discourse because it's important that they see how right we are how much division has happened? How many governments have been shut down? Because people are convinced that they're right and the other side is not right. And so we're going to shut the whole thing down because I'm right. Idiots. Who voted for these people? 
Father, I know your word says we're supposed to pray for those that are in power. So right now I take back my, I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. We do need to pray for them. They got a mess to fix, don't they? But we get so focused on our being right that we choose rightness over his righteousness. It can mess a lot of stuff up. It can absolutely mess a lot of stuff up. We've got to pursue his kingdom and his righteousness. Let me talk to you for just a couple minutes about what this means, his kingdom. The word kingdom is the word basilia in the uh, Greek language, and it means the realm, the dominion, the area of rule of the king. Jesus said that we are to pursue God's kingdom. Now, he also, in another part of Scripture, said, don't look over here or don't look over there when they say the kingdom's over there, the kingdom's... He said, because the kingdom is within you. See, the realm where the Lord has authority is within you. The dominion where he wants authority is within you. It's the reason that it says in Scripture that the kingdom suffers violence but the violent shall take it by force. How is that so? It's not talking about physical violence. It's talking about going contrary to the violent adversary that we have, the adversary that is against our soul, that recognizes that God's kingdom, his dominion, his rule is within us, so he violently attacks the kingdom. The kingdom within you suffers violence because you have an enemy that comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, and if you're going to take authority and take dominion in the kingdom, you've got to do it violently against your evil spiritual enemy. Man, he talks so much trash. The enemy is a trash talker. He tracks, he talks more trash than, than, than the biggest dudes, trash talkers in the, in the NBA, man. Those boys can talk some trash on the, on the court. And the enemy talks trash, and he'll be in your face. He'll be talking about you, talking about your mama, talking about all the stuff you've done, throwing things up in your face, bringing your past up before you. And he's constantly trying to convince you that you do not have dominion, that you do not have authority, that you do not have any power, because he does not want you ever to be unleashed to walk in what God has called you to walk in. So we've got to fight. We've got to rise up. Because when we get a revelation of the kingdom of God inside of us, the authority that we walk in, the dominion that he's given us, when we get a revelation of that and we begin to step out in life, we begin to walk out into these uh, atmospheres and these circles of influence, we walk into our business circles, we walk into our, uh, our educational circles, we walk into our neighborhood circles, any places that we have been given a place, a position, we have the authority then to walk in there and release his kingdom, his dominion, and his power, we carry it with us. It's massively important that we have a revelation of it. But this is just one of the things Jesus said to pursue. His kingdom and his righteousness. Let me talk to you for just a moment about his righteousness. His righteousness is nothing like your righteousness. Paul described and Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was, was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin. He had all of these stats. He had all of these recommendations. He had all of these things that he could go on and on and on about how much of an amazing Jew he was. But he said that he considered them, he considered them filthy rags. Another place he said that his works, he considered them dung. Your righteousness will never make it. It's his righteousness that counts. His righteousness. See, it says that he has given us a robe of righteousness and a garment of salvation. It's, it's literally something that we wear. It's a royal robe that we wear. And the problem with a lot of believers is they don't know who they are, and they don't know how they're dressed. 
When you know who you are, and you know how you're dressed, and you know what you're dressed for, you behave a certain way. If I'm going to go out in the garage and work, if I'm going to go out in the yard, I don't put on my best suit. If I'm in my best suit, I don't go work in the yard. Ladies, if, if, if you're going to go out and do some work, you're going to go get in the garden, plant some flowers, whatever you like to do. You, you don't go put on an evening gown to go get on your knees and dig in the dirt. The problem with a lot of Christians is that they're wearing these royal robes, these royal gowns, this incredible ensemble of Jesus' clothing, and they don't know it. And so we act at a much lower level because we don't know what we wear. We got to pursue his righteousness, his righteousness. See, when you have, this is really powerful. When you have a revelation, when you have a revelation of his righteousness, it changes what you do and you begin to act more righteous. You begin to behave according to that righteousness because you're aware that he's already made you righteous. It's not something you earn. It's something that you act, in, you act out because of how he's clothed you and what he's put on you. And in this new year, it's important that we pursue these two things. We want to accomplish great things this year. It's a year of no excuses. We want to do, you may have goals that you have. I, and, and listen, I hope you set incredible goals. And if I have time, I may go through a couple things to help you uh, be able to set some really, really great and practical goals. I hope you've got great, great goals. I hope you have goals for what you want to earn. I hope you have goals for what you want to accomplish. I hope you have goals for what you want to do with building your business. I hope you have goals for your personal health. I hope you have goals for your relationships. And I hope, they're, I hope you have goals for your spiritual life. I'll tell you one of the coolest goals I've ever, I've ever heard of. One of the ladies in my church, she is a financial planner. Um, she has a business. It's a financial planning business. She oversees a billion dollars. She came out of abject poverty. She has worked her whole life. She's in her 60s, built this business. And she um, and her husband... They said the turning point in their relationship, their turning point in their finances, when they went from struggling constantly to all of a sudden moving and beginning to make incremental uh, strides in their personal finance, was, was when her husband forced her, because she didn't have the faith to, but he forced her to start tithing. And so she began to obey a biblical principle out of obligation to, to honor her husband even though she wasn't doing it in faith and it worked anyway <laughs> you can do the right thing with the wrong motive and it still works sometimes so now here they are decades later and they no longer make goals for how much they want to earn they make goals for how much they want to give away how much do you want to give away this year how much do you want to give to the kingdom this year? And then they set big goals. And then they go figure out how to earn enough to be able to give the way they want to give. They flip the whole thing upside down. Flip the whole thing upside down. Why? Because it works. And so she does financial seminars all over, has massively huge clients. And the, one of the number one things that she teaches her clients is they need to be givers. It's an incredible goal to be the most generous version of you you could ever be in this year. No excuses. Be the most generous person you could possibly be. Generosity is one of the greatest, if not, I'm going to say it this way. I believe generosity is the greatest expression of the love of God. Because if it wasn't for God's generosity, we would have never received Jesus. It's the greatest expression that we have. Generous with our time, generous with our finances, generous with our effort, generous with our energy, generous with our attention. Yeah. 
makes a massive difference. Look at what it says in James chapter 1, verse 21. He says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Can, can I tell you, I don't know if I need to tell you, but, but do you realize how filthy this world is? The overflow of wickedness. I have an eight-year-old and a 14-year-old, and my eight-year-old wanted to watch a little show on TV. Uh, I looked it up because I'm a good parent, and I don't want my kids to watch things that are inappropriate for their age. And so it was rated G. So I said, sure, you can watch it. And I'm in the kitchen, and I'm making dinner, and I'm hanging out, and I hear a word that has four letters in it. And I'm like, what are you watching? She tells me the show, the show you told me I could watch. It's G-rated. I said, it's G-rated with four-letter words in it. I look at the screen, it's got these, and, and listen, no condemnation for people that go through stuff. Everyone goes through stuff. I've been through stuff. But it's got these, you know, a little, uh, three little divorcee mommies, and they're out there on, at a dance club getting, getting jiggy with it and got guys dancing with them. And, and I'm listening to them. this is a G-rated show, and they're out there shaking it. And it looks like dirty dancing. And I got my eight-year-old watching a G show. The world is filthy. Filthy. My 14-year-old, we're discussing, okay, are we going to let her watch stuff that's PG-13 now that she's 14? And when I look at some of this stuff, I don't need to be watching PG-13. For crying out loud, some of this stuff, it's the overflow of wickedness. And we can get numb to it. Because it's just flowing and overflowing in our world's culture. And so the scripture says, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness. Do you know what meekness is? Meekness is incredible strength under submission. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. That word implanted, it means, it's two words, in and born. It's speaking of when the word of God penetrates into your heart and is born within you and begins to create God's new life inside of you. Lay aside filthiness, the overflow of wickedness. Come on, if we're going to pursue the kingdom and we're going to pursue righteousness, we've got to lay aside certain things that take us the wrong way, lay aside certain things, certain habits that pull us downhill instead of habits that help us to drive ourselves uphill toward that upward call that we have in Christ Jesus. And we've got to focus on the implanted word of God that is able to save our souls. One of the greatest habits that you need to have every single day of your life is making sure that you are implanting God's word into your soul, implanting his word into your heart, letting the creative life essence of his word come into your life. So many times we wake up in the morning, I don't know about you, but my alarm clock is on my phone, my everything is on my phone, my phone is my office, it's where I am. I, 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 it just has become that way in our modern world. My phone goes off, I pick up my phone, I have to make myself not go right into just doing life in the phone because I don't want that to be my priority. So I have to intentionally make God my first re the first thing I'm reaching for in a day. Something I have to discipline in myself. In myself that I'm going to reach for the word. I'm going to reach for prayer. I'm going to reach for some worship. I'm going to reach because it's too easy just to grab these things that are counterfeits. They're empty calories. And we got to choose things that are nutritious that take us the right direction. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I've heard it said that the most dangerous form of deception is self-deception because you don't know you're deceived. 
If we're hearers but not doers, we deceive ourselves. We've got to be doers of the word. We've got to be people that put this stuff into action. I want to take you to another passage in James where it talks about this. James chapter 2 verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Now I want to lead you in an interesting balance between this because I was just talking to you about Christ's righteousness, pursuing his righteousness. It is a righteousness based on faith in his works and not earned by your works. But there's a balance. Because Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own works, so that no one can boast but we are saved unto good works that he has prepared for us in advance to do, to walk in. So God, knowing that you would believe, knowing that you would receive his inborn word, knowing that you would come to faith in him, he planted opportunities all throughout your life that although you were saved by grace, through faith and not by works, so you couldn't boast about how self-righteous you are. In fact, any righteousness that you boast about or brag about is self-righteousness, and it's putrid to God. The only thing good in me is Him. You take Him and His influence out of me, and I am a hot mess. I, I will destroy everything in my life without him and me. The only reason I'm still married after 22 and a half years is him. It ain't me. It ain't her. We're frail, fragile people. Mess up all the time. It doesn't say that righteous people never fall. It says righteous people always get up. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. The biggest thing the enemy wants to tell you when you fall is, see, I thought you were a Christian. See, you should just hang this thing up. See, you're not really a believer. See, you don't really live this. See, you're not really any good. See, nothing ever changed. See, this, this, this doesn't even matter. See, it makes more sense. You should just believe in aliens. See, you should, <laughs> sorry, I don't get that. I don't get the alien thing. I don't understand people, these scientists now that believe in aliens but not God. I, I don't get it. Praise the Lord. Uh, but, but the enemy wants to deceive in any possible way he can to prove how unrighteous you are. And the beautiful thing is this. Jesus actually said, unless you can have a righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees, you cannot be my disciple. You can't be no part of me. The beautiful thing is he provided a righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees. It's his righteousness not one that man earns. However, there is a balance because true faith, according to James, the brother of Jesus, true faith is only real faith if there's action accompanying it. It's not action that saves you, but it's action that shows that you actually have faith in the first place. What does it profit if someone says he has faith but doesn't have any works? He goes into this whole thing about seeing people that are hungry and not feeding them, seeing people that are cold and not, and not uh, meeting their need. Essentially, he's saying that if you say that you have faith but you're not acting on it, your faith is empty. It's worthless. Verse 18, he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, James says, and I will show you my faith by my works. I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe. He's being sarcastic here. And they tremble. But do you want, but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Watch this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. 
Let me take a second and talk to you about this Abraham. And talk to you about some habits that Abraham had. We read the story of Abraham, and you can literally, you can read the whole story of Abraham in the Bible in about 10 minutes. And we don't realize that we were introduced to Abraham when he was 75 years old. And we watch him walk through this path in his life. And it takes us 10 minutes to read it. But we have a glimpse of a hundred years of Abraham's life in about five chapters in the Bible. A hundred years. He gets a promise. He grabs his wife, who apparently was also his half-sister. Told you I'd tie that in. They met at a fish fry in Iraq. I don't know. Um... And, and, he, and he, God says, go into the land, I'll show you. He gets about halfway there. He sets up camp. He stops in Haran. His, the rest of his family comes. His, his brother comes. Um, his brother's wife comes. His dad comes. And, and, they, and they stop there. And God chastised him and says, I didn't tell you to stop here. I told you to go to the land I'm going to show you. And so he obeys and he goes. And God begins in Genesis 12 to, to, to speak to him about this promise and this destiny, this future, and the many generations that would come. More than a decade and a, and a half goes by, and finally they're getting a little frustrated because there's no babies coming. And Abraham is now 85, and Sarah's uh, 75 or, or, or whatever, and, and she's not getting any younger, and neither is he. And so she gives him the, her maidservant, and they make Ishmael. And so now he's got a son, and, and God comes and says, you're going to have a son. He says, I got a son. He says, no, through Sarah. And God says, well, can't you just bless Ishmael? Yes, I'll bless him, but I'm going to have a son for you through Sarah. It was 25 years before the son came. 25 years that Abraham had to trudge this thing out in faith, believing that these fleeting experiences that he'd had with this creator. Now, now don't get me wrong. It's incredible experiences listed, but they didn't have a Bible He would have an experience and then nothing for years. Very easy to make excuses. Very easy to opt out. But he kept believing. As the story goes and as this passage I just read mentions, he gets to a place where now he's had this son Isaac, he's over 100 years old. He, let's, let, let's call him 115. Let's just say that Isaac was 15 years old. We don't really know the age. Some theologians want to say that he was a grown man, but it's not true because in the passage, God calls him a boy. So he was old enough to carry a, a, a large load of firewood and hike up a mountain not knowing that it was the firewood that he was going to be tied and laid upon. So he was small enough or young enough that Abraham could pick him up and lay him on the altar and get ready to slay him. God stops his hand and says, now I see, now I see. In fact, I'll read this to you real quick. This is Genesis twenty-two thirteen, 13. And, and God says, now I see that I can trust you Don't lay a hand on the boy. Look and see there's a a ram over here in the thicket. And then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. As it is said, in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, uh, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you. Listen to this promise. Check this out. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. Your descendants as the stars of the heavens... 
and the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is a wonderful, can you, can you imagine the pressure that Abraham must have felt hearing a word from God to go kill his son? Can you imagine the pressure? Sarah asking questions. Where are you going, Abe? Uh, a little camping trip. We're, uh, we're going we're gonna to go camp a little bit and uh, worship the Lord and... Uh, can you imagine the pressure? I can't hide anything from my wife. She like looks through me. What are you not telling me? The whole way, holding it in. Imagine the pressure. Imagine the angst. Imagine the emotion. Three days journey. Finally getting to the top. Having the conversation with Isaac. Isaac. I know this doesn't make any sense, son. Yes, I love you. Yes, I would do anything for you. But this is what God said, and you have to, I, who knows what the conversation was like. Just to put himself in position to make no excuses. See, the, the trap, when you know that you've heard God and God has given you something, come on, this is a hundred and 15 years in the making of Abraham's destiny. This is minimum 35 years of Abraham hearing a promise from God. And now he's seeing his 15-year-old promise. I'm making up an age. He's seeing the promise. He's got all the memories, all the birthdays, all of the lessons, all the experiences. He's having the argument with God. But God, you said, but God, this is your, but you made this promise. But God. And Abraham had the opportunity to allow the promise to come the priority over the provider. When the promise that God has given you takes priority over him, over him as the provider, it's just become an idol in your life. Could be a career that you know God gave you. Could be a relationship. Could be a talent that you know you use for him. But our motives can get off. Now check this out. Abraham obeys God. It's credited to him as righteousness. He's the father of faith righteousness. He, he has now pursued his kingdom, his righteousness. Remember the promise Jesus said, and all these things will be added unto you. There's, there's now a, a, a ram over here to sacrifice. He gets his promised son back off the altar, redeemed now. Redeemed by God. He has secured now for the earth a perpetual blessing where now God is saying, blessing, I will bless you. What does that mean? God is saying, blessing is my nature. Blessing is who I am. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, that's who God is, a multiplier. Multiplying, I will multiply. I am blessing and I am multiplying. And now that I have seen that you are willing to sacrifice it all, now I'm seeing that you're willing to make no excuses, that you're willing to do anything and everything I'm, I've ever said, blessing who I am, I will pour out blessing upon you. Multiplying who I am, I will multiply unto you. And you will see this one will become a multitude greater than the stars in the sky, greater than the sand on the seashore. Because you have believed. And I've heard that preached 800 million times. But I've never seen what I saw on the airplane, Adam, when I was flying here. And I was praying. I was praying in the spirit. And I was asking God to show me something for you. Genesis 22, verse 20. All of a sudden, something happens. The very next thing after Abraham obeyed and they went back and they camped in Beersheba and, and, and life went on. Years went on. 
There's a span of time. We don't know how much time transpired here because every one of the glimpses we see with Abraham, it, we, we see a picture of Abraham's story and then 10 or 15 years go by. And then we see another story and another uh, 10 or 15 years go by. And we see another story and we see the story of Abraham in these glimpses of span of, of, of years. It's not, it's not this chronological walking step by. It is, but there's these gulfs of time in between these landmark moments. Abraham, after obeying God, the very next part of the story that we hear is that this promise of blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you, has leapfrogged to the other side of Abraham's family. So the blessing, when Abraham passed the test, when Abraham made no excuses, when Abraham was willing to give that sacrificial offering, and he passed the test in that way, and he tripped this wire in his life, he tripped this trigger of blessing and multiplying in his life, he had no idea the butterfly effect that it would have on his brother's household hundreds and hundreds of miles away. But now it came to pass after all these things that it was told to Abraham saying, Indeed, Milka, which means queen, has also borne children to your brother Nahor, which means snorer. Aren't you glad you're not married to a guy named Snorer? They don't make a CPAP machine big enough for a dude whose name is Snorer. I believe that it's symbolic, these two names. Symbolic, number one, of a royal lineage that was inside of Milka. The reason that Milka's name is mentioned first instead of Abraham's own brother, Nahor, the snorer. There was a royal lineage that was tied up inside of her that could not come to life because there was something asleep in Nahor. And the obedience of Abraham triggered a butterfly effect to his family hundreds of miles away, and all of a sudden they begin to produce, and they produced eight sons, the last of whom was named Bethuel, and it says, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. Later as this story progresses, Rebekah, a few decades later, a couple decades later, would be the one that would be Isaac, the one who came off the altar, Isaac's wife. The obedience of Abraham didn't just make a difference in his own personal household. It had a quantum effect on the other lives around him that would be, in, that would be involved in the blessing, I will bless you, multiplying, I will multiply you. And his son's unborn wife would now, through a chain of events, be triggered and come to life because of his obedience. My question is this What's at stake? That you don't even know exists. What's at stake that doesn't even, that's not even inside of, of created time yet? It's not even born yet. But the decisions that we make with our life have a butterfly effect. The decisions we make with our habits have a butterfly. How many people do you know? That because of a grandfather that had horrific habits and he scarred generations of his family. And you have people that live in the wake of destruction of a forefather. Scripture says that the curse goes down three or four generations. But the blessing of God for a thousand generations. What if we could be the type of people that make no excuses? What if we could be the type of people 
that obey sacrificially? What if we could be the type of people that instead of reaching for these things that are comfort to us right now, we reach for other things that cause us to dig deeper, to be a better person that provokes greatness in the lives of people all around us. And we don't even know the people because of the butterfly effect of the blessing I will bless you, the multiplying I will multiply you. We have no idea what we trigger in the supernatural realm that comes full circle later on in our life. The blessing for our children and our children's children children, the blessing for our kids' future spouses because of the offerings that we give, the sacrifices that we make, the pursuit of his kingdom and his righteousness, it's not for nothing. It's not for nothing. It has a massive impact on your legacy, your children, your children's children. We've got to make no excuses.